just another passenger who gave his name as D.A. Cooper. Dressed in a business suit demanding $200,000 and carrying a plain briefcase which he told the crew held explosive. The rear stairwell was open all the way. It arrived at Reno in shreds. Somewhere, the hijacker parachuted away with the money. Vanishing Point is brought to you by the Falcon Skydiving School of Seattle, teaching skydiving ever since 1971. Disclaimer, we don't condone any of the actions taken by a certain Dan Cooper in today's episode of Vanishing Point. In the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, a man who identified himself as Dan Cooper purchased a one-way ticket from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington on Northwest Airlines Flight 305 which contained 36 other passengers, as well as a crew of six. His only piece of baggage was a briefcase. Once he boarded the aircraft, Cooper made himself comfortable in the middle of three seats on the final row. Once the flight was cleared for departure, Cooper turned around and handed a note to a flight attendant by the name of Florence Schaffner. On the note was written that Cooper had a bomb and that he would like to sit her beside him. Florence hesitatingly sat beside Cooper and glanced into his briefcase. She saw what appeared to be eight sticks of dynamite inside of it. Cooper then demanded $200,000 in cash, four parachutes, and a fuel truck ready to refuel once they landed. And if they failed to satisfy his demands, he threatened he would, quote, do the job. Schaffner then went to inform the crew about the hijacking, while another flight attendant by the name of Tina Mucklow stood by Cooper's side. The plane reaches Seattle, and over the next one and a half hours, the flight remained in a circular pattern, while authorities scrambled to gather the ransom and the parachutes. And finally, at 5.45 p.m., two hours later after its scheduled arrival, the plane finally lands. The ransom was brought onto the plane. In exchange, Cooper allowed two flight attendants as well as all of the passengers to leave the aircraft. With only four crew members on board, Cooper's next planned destination was Mexico City, but this was later rejected because the plane wouldn't have enough fuel. After a bit of disagreements, the crew and Cooper agreed on a refueling stop at Reno, Nevada. He also insisted that the wing flaps be angled at 15 degrees and that the aft stairway was to be deployed. This was denied by the captain because the plane could not take off with the stairway deployed. Flight 305 was back in the air at 7.36 p.m. after problems with refueling, but while waiting for the plane to refuel, Cooper became so impatient with the refueling that no flight plan was assigned, so the captain took an airway known as Victor 23. Later into the flight, he asked Mako to return to the cockpit and requested to not be disturbed from that point on. The last time Mako saw Cooper was when she was glancing into the cabin and saw him standing in the middle of the aisle as if he was preparing to jump. Once the flight came to an end, the crew ventured into the cabin but found no signs of Cooper nor the bomb only an aft stairway that was extended mid-flight and slightly damaged. There was only one explanation to the vanishing. At some point during the flight, Cooper had strapped on a parachute and leaped into the dark of night. When questioned by the FBI, the crew stated that around 8.10 p.m. they felt an oscillation in the plane that was possibly produced by Cooper's jump. Using the knowledge of the time and the airway taken, the FBI created an approximate time of the jump and constructed an impressive search operation that is located around 40 kilometers north of Portland, Oregon. But despite their efforts, not a single trace of Cooper was ever found. A part of the problem was that the terrain was cold to the mountains as well as the dense forests stretching for miles. 
Having made zero progress on the search, the FBI resorted to focusing on the ransom money. Since the money was collected from Seattle's first National Bank ransom package, the bill's serial numbers were already documented for such occasions. Keep in mind that 200000 back then is around $1.3 million present. In order to prevent Cooper from spending the money, the serial numbers of the banknotes were leaked into the public, and cash prizes were offered for people who could find banknotes with matching serial numbers. On February 10, 1980, almost a decade later after the hijacking, a small boy by the name of Brian Ingram, while building a campfire on Tina Beach, was digging into the sand when he discovered bundles of severely degraded cash that added up to a total of $5,880. Knowing about the infamous skyjacking, the boy and his parents reported the money to the FBI, and sure enough, the serial numbers did match with the ones from the ransom. But this caused more question than it answers. How did the money get there? Was there an alternative drop zone? Did Cooper drop money into the river? Did he hide them there himself? Is he even alive? The truth is that nobody knows. These are questions we will probably never know the answers to. With the FBI concluding its investigation in 2016 due to a lack of new information, there are so many questions left unanswered. Sometimes though, the questions left unanswered are the most fascinating, most interesting to ask. Thank you for listening to Vanishing Point, and stay tuned for episode 2, where we will be discussing the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. As always, thank you for listening. Once again, we thank the Falcon Skydiving School of Seattle for sponsoring this podcast. With us starting from $305.99, we will teach you how to jump into thin air. Sign up at falconskydive.seattle.com and use code VanishingPoint for 15% off your first lesson.